Chairman. Uh, thank you for those kind words. And uh, I would like also, like the other speakers, <coughs> to thank the Sri Lanka Army for organizing this conference. Um, the search for a balance between hard power and soft power is at the heart of the intellectual debate. And so the uh, Sri Lanka Army has been forward thinking and very relevant, I think, in trying to bring this topic to the heart of the discussion today. So, <clears throat> so distinguished delegates, there are many questions that will be posed, and I hope in the panel discussions tomorrow you will have the chance to discuss more freely. From my perspective, it's always very difficult to come at the end of a panel because you don't know uh, what the other panelists will say before you, and quite often they will say what you are going to say anyway. Um, but in this particular instance, there is, in fact, a difference in the presentations. The first speaker, who is an expert on NATO, spoke from very much in that perspective. Uh, Professor Zaman brought the soft power discourse into domestic politics. Uh, these are both the areas in which uh, my presentation will not venture. But I am interested in international relations and in diplomacy and in public diplomacy. So my focus will be on that. Now, um, several speakers today have already spoken about Kautilya. There is another in China, Sun Tzu, ancient treaties dealing with the art of combining military power and diplomatic persuasion in the pursuit of national self-interest. Kautilya's Artha Shastra, dating to the fourth century BCE, refers to a five-prong model of options for a ruler to achieve his strategic objectives. Collusion, cooperation, alliance, acquisition, or destruction. This is echoed in modern balance of power theory. Strategies like bandwagoning and balancing, <coughs> cooperation with security blocks, neutrality, etc. In those days, pragmatism and realism rather than idealism and ethics guided the thinking of these early strategists. Military power and economic power in Kautilya's world reigned supreme, and any means were acceptable to achieve these ends, such as assassinations, spies, and secret agents, duplicity in negotiations were freely discussed. Now today, these are matters which would fall within covert operations and rarely discussed in public. So why is the world of today so very different? The main reason is, of course, the rise of the United Nations, to which Professor Zaman has already referred, after the catastrophic events of World War II. Uh, while he mentions the main pillar of disarmament, I would also add the second pillar, promotion of human rights. The very first resolution adopted by the UN General Assembly called for the elimination of all forms of WMD and the subsequent adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights set out standards which have influenced constitution making around the world. A huge body of international law and humanitarian law has come into existence under UN auspices, which have a direct bearing on the conduct of war today. So ethical choice has come to hold a place in strategic thinking, and it is to such examples in history we are drawn today. Already, several people have spoken about Emperor Ashoka, probably the most famous of the Mauryan rulers in the third century BCE, who is said to have conquered virtually all of India, except parts of what is today Tamil Nadu and Kerala. He is said to have repented and converted to Buddhism after the Kalinga War, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of casualties. But Ashoka's place in history is defined not by his territorial conquests, but by his vision of upholding the Buddhist teachings as a cultural foundation for political unity and good governance. While Ashoka's gift 
of the teachings to Sri Lanka. It's recorded in our chronicles with exaltation and praise. Historians suggest that this mission represented, in fact, a sophisticated strategy of peacemaking, diplomacy with states on the outer circle of the Mauryan Empire. Whatever the underlying motives, the outcome is clear. It has enabled a huge dividend in terms of friendship at the people-to-people -people level between Sri Lanka and India, which has endured through many centuries. Thousands of pilgrims undertake the Buddhist circuit in India every year, and from time to time, sporadic attacks by fringe groups in Tamil Nadu set off shockwaves in the Sri Lanka press, and the flows diminish temporarily. But in a short while, they resume again. Such is the enduring strength of the force of attraction through civilizational ideas, which I present today with the Asokan example as a striking historic example. So assuming soft power was known and practiced in the maintenance of national security in ancient times, what else is new today? So we need to understand the value of the huge theoretical debate that has arisen on the underpinnings of soft power in the contemporary world and the identifying of defining principles as they affect the making of both foreign policy and defense policy. So everyone today is talking of Joseph Nye, who is the best known exponent of soft power, who set the discussions in the frame of the changing global power equations, which has witnessed the rise, or the return as he calls it, of India and China, as well as the communication revolution which has diffused power to many new stakeholders. What I find interesting are these principles. Now he speaks, for example, of avoiding the Thucydides trap, referring inter alia to the fear-mongering, which is said to have triggered unending war between Athens and Sparta in classical times. He suggests basic principles, such as credibility in strategic communication, seeking out of win-win solutions in order to achieve the ultimate goal of smart power. Now, these principles are visible in the Ashokan example, credible message, mutually beneficial partnership, long-term durable outcome. The academic debate on soft power is in fact taking place at a time when traditional hard power is under pressure in many different ways to which the earlier speakers have already referred. In some countries which have voluntary recruitment to the armed forces, enlistment is dropping sharply. Elsewhere, popular sentiment is mobilizing for the reduction of military expenditure and release of these funds for education, health, and social services. Yet another factor is the imposition of a huge body of international law, effectively banning the use of many types of weaponry and imposing behavioral standards through the popularization of IHL. Now, these challenges have resulted in enhancing the trend towards civil-military cooperation and have given an in impetus to the induction of new technologies such as robo robots and drones. So what we see today is, as a result, the technological divide is also deepening between countries. Those at the more advanced end have moved on to address threats in the cyber domain. And cyber security partnerships are being forged for protection of critical infrastructure and combating of cyber crime. Major attitudinal changes have occurred since the World Information Summit in Tunis in 2005, for example where countries imposing firewalls on the internet came in for much criticism. Today, 10 years on, firewalls, monitoring data, filtering websites, social network surveillance have all become acceptable, and the line between censorship and security is blurring. So in the background of these key, what are the key questions? I would say it is to answer a question posed by the chairman. It revolves not if, but when, where, and how soft power resources can be balanced with hard power to achieve optimum results. So let us look at this relationship between soft power and hard power. They appear to be very different forces, even opposites in some ways. Military power is lethal, for the most part under the control of governments, and its assets are quantifiable such that organizations all over the world keep count of military personnel, numbers of ships, tanks, aircraft. However, soft power defies such analysis and can be looked at only through a qualitative lens. It is user-specific, multifaceted, depending on the ideology and the purpose and expertise which drives it. For all these reasons, its force of attraction is growing 
not only with the democratization of the net, but also as a result of the scattering of populations and the basic human needs of identity with race, religion, culture, while resident in alien surroundings, what we call the diaspora, and some would refer to as non-resident. There should be no mistake. Will soft power displace hard power? No. Hard power will always be required for deterrence and protection. But if we accept the traditional wisdom that confrontation and coercion through military means should remain as the option of last resort, how can we shape the preference of others through attraction and achieve our security goals through such instruments as we talk of today in public diplomacy, diplomacy, strategic communications, exchange partnerships, humanitarian assistance. So this is where the theoretical analysis of country situations is useful to identify what works, what doesn't, and where are the pitfalls. The problem is that experience in handling conflict around the world by balancing military power with soft power is extremely varied. In some instances, negotiations and carrots have succeeded in making the resort to military means unnecessary. In other cases, like here in Sri Lanka, years of peace negotiations culminated in military force that brought a 30-year armed conflict to an end. However, academics now suggest that this outcome did not provide a lasting solution, due in part to negative perceptions which arose by the creation of notions of winners and losers, necessitating the comprehensive program of reconciliation and development that is ongoing in Sri Lanka. At a time when the armed conflict in Sri Lanka was brought to an end with the support of the majority of the population, a public debate has also arisen on the role of the United Nations. What is the balance between questions at the international level on humanitarian legality as against the restoration of normal law and order, the relief of a population free of bombs, explosions, and assassinations? Is it not possible that a society, especially one with old civilizational roots, could heal itself? So some say the United Nations, in fact, is at its best when dealing with global threats, climate change, pandemics, the spread of narcotic drugs, where international networking and action are indispensable. We would agree with this, for we in Sri Lanka came to appreciate international solidarity at the time of the tsunami that hit this crisis on Christmas Day 2004. One catastrophic event over a few hours, more deadly than 30 years of conflict. However, it should be noted that when international evaluation was made of the relief efforts after the Indian Ocean tsunami, what was underlined as of critical importance in the first 24 or 48 hours was the availability of domestic or local support mechanisms. Now in Sri Lanka, we are fortunate. Time and time again, at time of disaster, the people come forward spontaneously to help and give what they have. The temples, covils, mosques, and churches open their doors freely to the victims without discrimination. But I see this duality as the most complicated objectives that security planners face today, balancing the demands of international standards and solidarity on one hand, and strengthening of domestic or local mechanisms for handling emergencies on the other hand. Now, military cooperation appears easy to organize and is becoming systematized at the international level with joint exercises, confidence building measures, hotlines, etc. However, soft power resources, on the other hand, defies such monitoring and coordination. Ironically, with the democratization of the internet and the bringing down of the cost of information, communications, and computers, the enhanced distribution through internet cafes and networks, it is the dark side of soft power which is emerging as a major threat today. Today we have a phenomenon of young people, even children, who appear quite normal and well-adjusted, who could literally turn themselves into weapons destroying countless innocent civilians. And as the Star Wars movie reminded us, even the best of the Jedi could be converted to the dark side. So there are limitations of soft power, and other speakers will speak to this later. And unfortunately, there is little consensus on the way forward to counter the threat of violent extremism. It can be launched from such basic platforms as online magazines. Should these online magazines be banned, or will doing so only magnify the threat level? 
Soft power countermeasures are difficult to deploy and subject to contestation and misunderstanding, while their outcomes are unpredictable. Preferred domestic options up to now have been such as education and integration. These are long-term policies. And in the meantime, public objections to limits on individual privacy are complicating the efforts of intelligence professionals to detect early warning of attack. One other point is worth underlining, however, uh, I'm coming to fairly quickly to the conclusion of my presentation, that however much of soft power is deployed, even in the form of good public diplomacy initiatives, they cannot cover what is inherently bad policy. Aided by whistleblowers and hackers, there's increased public scrutiny together today with regard to high-level policy decisions, such as that of going into a foreign war. This is seen in the commissioning of the Chilcot report, which made a critical retrospective assessment of the decision-making process with regard to the UK's entry into the Iraq war. There is another point, and that is that evidence is mounting of a general discontent with foreign interventions, even under UN auspices. I note that the UN is now looking at robust, robust peacekeeping operations, but it seems to me that these operations cannot be sustained over a long period of time without building resistance in both sending and receiving countries. No amount of public diplomacy or soft power initiatives can address. In the past, those at the receiving end of foreign military interventions were urging caution. But now influential politicians from the Western world are joining the debate, asking whether foreign military interventions may in fact be a cause of triggering responses inciting hate and violence in various parts of the world. So a final point I make is that there is a culture difference. Those trained in hard power may find it difficult to adapt to the differing needs and facets of soft power. A culture change may be required in training methodology. So we in academia can set the scene and even walk with you, the professionals and the practitioners, into the classroom or the battlefield but are you ready for this challenge? Thank you.